Um, so thank you, and thank you for inviting me. This has been really great so far. I've never been here before, and it's really amazing here. Um, so I'm going to first introduce just a little bit about classical scissors congruence, and then we'll move on to the K-theoretic aspects. Um, oh, and because I always forget, this is joined with Anna-Marie Bowman, Tina Gerhard, Carrie Malkovich, and Mona Merling. OK. So scissors congruence is the following idea. Suppose that we have two polygons, like a triangle and a rectangle. These are not congruent. But if we have a pair of scissors, we can make them be congruent as long as they have the same area if we cut them enough. So for instance, if I cut down the altitude here and then the central line, and I cut you know, approximately like this, that's the wrong angle, but something like that. You can see that sort of this, assuming I'd drawn it with the correct proportions, would be like that. This would be this. This piece would be that piece. And that piece would be that piece. So after cutting them enough, they become congruent. And that's what scissors congruence is. Congruent, assuming you have a nice enough pair of scissors. Um, and for the kind of thing you do with polytopes, generally the, the uh, restriction is finitely many pieces, each of which is a polytope. Uh, which is a finite union of simplices of some variety. So something like this. And you can ask, OK, we have these nice geometric classical objects. What, when are they scissors congruent? If I just give you two polygons, when are they scissors congruent? And so the answer, this is a very old answer. Um, two polygons are scissors congruent if and only if they have the same area. And this is a very old result. This is how area was defined in Greece. So like, very old result. <laughs> um, OK, so what about, poly what about polyhedra? And for polyhedra, it's more difficult. Um, if you work. Um, if you, work with, if you try to work with polyhedra, you start noticing that, there, that the angles in polyhedra are much more complicated, because now you have two flavors of angles. You have the ones at the vertices, and you have the ones at the edges. And the edge ones sort of have length associated with them. And things get far more complicated. Um, so in 1901, Dane showed that volume is not enough. And he did this by constructing a second invariant on polyhedra that uh, was preserved under this kind of cutting. And you know, he didn't call it the Dane invariant, but we do. Um, and then in 1965, Seidler showed that these are enough. And at this point, um, when you start trying to work with higher dimensions, things become more complicated because now we can't even visualize these. Seidler's paper, by the way, he literally took two polyhedra with the same Dane invariant and figured out how to cut them up to rearrange them into one another, um, which I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, so in 1968, Jessen uh, rewrote Seidler's proof using group cohomology. And it turned out that once you rewrite the proof using group cohomology, A, the geometry becomes much simpler, um, and B, the proof automatically works in four dimensions. So now you have this result in four dimensions as well, that the volume and the Dane invariants separate all polyhedra. And plus, you, start, you can start asking questions like, OK, well, which volumes and Dane invariants can you get? And you can get some interesting answers that we're not going to go into. In uh, 1968, Jessen has this paper on the Dane-Seidler theorem. And it's an amazing paper, highly recommended. So how do you start doing the calculations if you've decided, OK, I want to turn this problem from geometry into algebra? Because you know, algebra is less scary than geometry, often. Um, well, we do this by defining a group. So if you have a geometry x, and really, I'm only going to be giving examples in Euclidean, but I mean like spherical, hyperbolic, one of the nice classical geometries, nothing nasty. We can define a scissors congruence. I'm actually I'm going to say G is a subgroup of the isometries. Let's jump directly to that. Um, I'm going to define a group P of xG. 
And this is the free abelian group on polytopes in X. And when I say polytope, I mean it has to be the same dimension as X. So if X is in four-dimensional geometry, this would better be a four-dimensional polytope. And we're going to quotient out by two relations. The first relation is that if you glue two of them together, this is the sum. And obviously, they can't overlap. And the second one is that if you move them using this isometries, you don't change the class. So the idea is, OK, you have a polyhedron or a polytope, and you take it, and you use this relation to cut it up into pieces, and then you use this relation to move the pieces around, and then you use this relation to move backwards, and that tells you that if two polytopes are scissors congruent, then they're equal in this group. And in fact, this is an if and only if. So p and q are scissors congruent if and only if p equals q in this group. And the uh, forward direction I just explained to you. The backward direction I'm not going to explain. I will tell you this is a fun thing to try to come up with a proof of. The first proof you come up with will probably be wrong. And the way to test it is to try it when the geometry you take is the hyperbolic plane with all ideal vertices and see if it works there, because it shouldn't. This is no longer true in that example. But the first proof people come up with will usually work in that situation. Um, so just as a warning. Um, OK. So now we're trying to just figure out what this group is. And we can say, oh, classifying scissors Kong is just constructing a nice set of invariants on this group. It's a very large group. Um, but you can. One thing to notice is that the group action is equivariant with respect to this relation. So we can notice directly from the definition that p of xg is the zeroth homology of g acting on p of x1, where 1 is the trivial group. And at this point, I really want to emphasize that g is discrete. Often in these situations, we have nice Lie groups, and we think of them as Lie groups. But the set of polytopes doesn't have a topology with, which, with respect to which, so that on this kind of thing, g will act continuously. So you must consider g as a discrete group, um, which obviously makes the situation even worse, because we had uncountably many generators, uncountably many relations, and now our group is terrible. So somehow, just everything keeps getting worse at every stage. Um, but it's fine. It's OK, because you know we're we do k-theory, and k-theorists are used to this kind of thing, or at least we know not to be scared too much. Um, I also just want to point out, it's also, if you have a nice normal subgroup of g, this is also h0 of g mod h with coefficients in p of x h. And this is actually, um, I started looking at this stuff when I was in graduate school. And I looked at this, and I was like, Serre spectral sequence? Like, we only have zeros, but like, doesn't that look like the lower left-hand corner of a Serre spectral sequence? Shouldn't there be some kind of thing like that? I just want to come back, mention that, because we're going to come back to it. So this is the beginnings of starting to try to analyze this purely geometrically. And DuPont and Sa did a bunch of calculations. They can, instead of just going for Euclidean things, they manage to compute invariants on these groups and sort of exact sequences containing these groups up to dimension 3 in spherical and hyperbolic geometry, which very much did not rely on the actual geometry of the situation and a lot of algebraic analysis. Um, again, there's a lot of interesting reading there that we are not going to talk about at all. Um, what I'm going to talk about is. If we look at this thing, and we're in a k-theoretic mood, that really looks like a k0. You know, OK, like we can do it in terms of this g, but shouldn't we also be able to do it in terms of some kind of k0 of something? And you know, why not? Um, I'm going to talk about assemblers very briefly. I will mention that we're, not, we're going to be generalizing them fairly quickly. So if you're wondering why some particular axioms are there, don't worry about it. They'll probably go away soon. Um, so the definition, an assembler, hang on, this board is too big.
An assembler, did I mess up the half? Yeah, I totally did, whatever. Um, an assembler is a growth and deke site. Satisfying the following extra axioms. So first, we're going to assume we have an initial object. And it has an empty covering family. Secondly, all morphisms are monic. And lastly, it has pullbacks. So you may be thinking of something along the lines of, oh, take the open subsets of a topological space. This will satisfy these axioms, but that's not what you should be thinking of, because that's an assembler that leads to a boring K theory. So you can totally do it. It does satisfy all the axioms. But this is the example that you should be thinking about, which I'm going to call, call P sub xg. This has objects, the empty set, and polytopes in x. And the morphism, so morphism from P to Q, is an element G and G, such that G acting on P is a subset of Q. So, you know, under inclusions, only allow, you're allowed to move things around first, um, but only by elements in G. And we're going to take the topology to um, be, you know, you have sets like this. So I is finite. And we want the union, I'll call these G sub i's, of G sub i acting on P sub i to be P. And we want the intersection of G sub i, P sub i, and G sub j, P sub j, to be kind of empty. In that the measure is 0. I just didn't leave myself uh, space to write measure in front, which is what I should have been doing. But I just mean they only intersect on the boundary. They're not going to overlap in any meaningful way. Um, so this is sort of the prototypical example of an assembler. You can think of you know, anything like this where things sort of you can decompose them into a reasonable number of pieces using some kind of reasonable notion of cutting. Um, and an assembler has an associated K-theory. And for now, I'm going to ignore how you get this K-theory. I'm just going to say it has a K-theory. And the K0 of an assembler is the free abelian group generated by objects A in our assembler. What did I call it? C. And then we're going to quotient out by the relation that whenever you have a covering family, the class of P is equal to the sum of the PIs. So this is exactly expressing the scissors congruence relations, only I'm allowing myself to cut into arbitrarily many pieces instead of just two at a time. One of the advantages of this, by the way, just as an, as an example, I said um, you want polytopes in X. Um, you could also say simplices. Now, you can't, if you want to do arbitrary cuts, you know, maybe you can't do uh, simplices and you know, pullbacks are going to be a problem. This axiom can be weakened. This is one of the ones that I was going to say, like, don't worry, it'll go away soon. Um, but you can do a version of this where you just take simplices. And simplices are often easier to work with than general polytopes. So this is the kind of thing that you might want to be doing. Okay. Oh, no, multiple. Oh, no, they do. They're just thinking. Nope, I can't move multiple ones at a time. That's terrible. Yeah, I really can't. OK.
Okay. So now we've just gotten more questions. We still have the question of how do we compute this thing, but, but now it's harder because it's k-theory. And we also have another question. So the questions are still how do we compute this? It's actually gotten worse because before we only had one group and now we have countably many groups, so now we've made the problem worse. And but we can now also ask questions like, is there a trace? K-theory generally has a trace of some sort. What would the trace look like? Can we use it to compute anything? So, so far, there's just a, a proliferation of questions. I'm going to start trying to get to the point where I can answer at least a few of them. Don't hold your breath, though. It's, you know. Um, OK. So when we moved to this perspective here, when we said, oh, it's the, the co-invariance of G, um, we sort of said, oh, look, we can act on this other group. And we have the same kind of notion in K-theory. If we have a group G acting on something with, a, with the K-theory, then you get a group action on the K-theory spectrum. And you can ask, OK, well, what if we do this before and what do we do it after? Do we have any kind of, uh, any kind of relationship between these things? So, here, we had an action on this group of G, and we could pull the G action out. Up there, we have an action of G on the assembler. If we take that group G up there to be trivial, so you're not allowed to move things. You're only allowed to cut them up. Um, so now it's, it's just the partial order of polytopes in the plane with this extra topology put on it. And now we have a group action on this. And so G acts on the spectrum of k of p of x1, which, by the way, I'm, I'm probably going to say this at some point in the talk, so I should define it. We call this no moving k theory, because you're not allowed to move things. Um, so we have this g action. Um, and so the question is, we have this k of p of xg, and we have the co-invariance here. And the question is, what's the relationship between these two? And similarly, just like over here where I said, oh, like, look, you can do this you know, one step at a time with a Serre spectral sequence. You know, maybe instead of just having an HG, we'll have P of X, H, and then we have an HG mod H on the outside. You know, how, how does that work? Does that give us anything? And so the theorem. And this is is that these are equivalent. Um, so if you can figure out what this is, you can compute this using standard G invariant techniques. And I, I say this as though it's easy, but that remind you that G is a Lie group made discrete. So in the nice Euclidean case that we can occasionally visualize, that is you know, tra all translations and all rotations with real coefficients, but considered as a discrete group. So I'm just, again, mentioning none of this is going to be nice. But the statement of the theorem kind of is. Um, and more generally, like, this is, not, this is a, not a thing of just about scissors congruence. This is actually something that holds for a general assembler. So if C is an assembler with a G action, then I'm going to define this object here. K, K of C H G is K of C H G. So this is a very general theorem. There's a lot of different things you can apply it to. Um, it was motivated by the stuff about scissors congruence, but it's, it's far more general. So I want to talk about how to define this C of H G. So, I mean, really, it's just the growth and deconstruction of G acting on C. But because hopefully we'll have at least a little bit of time to talk about proofs, I want to write this out in a little bit of detail. So the objects are the objects of C. And a morphism from A to B is a pair uh, G, which is going to be an element of G 
and a morphism f from g acting on a to b. And then you compose these in the way that you usually compose things. So if we have a morphism from a to b, sorry, this is g acting, g not g, sorry, g acting on a and then b. So we have this action by g, and then we have a map down to b, and then we have a map down from h, act to act, h acting on b to c. Then we have this nice square. And we can com complete it by having H act here. And this is going to be HG acting on A. And I suppose I should give this a name. That's F. This is G acting on F. And then you compose down here. And this outside square is, uh, is the composition. So this is the, the usual growth and deconstruction. Um, but this observation that you can complete these squares turns out to be a real, real key in the proof. And I wanted uh, people to see it explicitly. And then the topology, because we need a topology for this to be a growth index site, we're going to say that we have FIGI from AI to B is a covering family if if this collapsed version is a covering family in C. And the, once we have this definition written down, and we have the definition up there, which I, I, there's no way I can reach, so I'm glad that I remember that it's up there, um, you can see that P of xg is actually isomorphic to p of x1 sub hg. So if we want to understand p of xg, really we want to understand p of x1. So how do we understand p of x1? So k of p of x1. So I haven't talked about this group here, when, uh, this group right here, p of x1. But it's a nice group. This is the Steinberg module of whatever your ambient space is. Um, if you've heard that name. If not, what you should know is it's a free abelian group. It's very large. I'm not going to tell you a basis because it won't be useful for you. I'll just tell you it's very large. But it is a free abelian group. Um, and so somehow, even though these are computations are very nasty, it's at least vaguely reassuring that we can give a nice description of this group. And it's free abelian, and things are nice. So it turns out you can do the, uh, the same thing in this situation. So first off, there exists this space, which we're going to call PT of x. I'm going to explain what all of this is in a second. And so PT of x, first off, it's equivalent to a wedge of n spheres. So I'm going to say that the dimension of x is n. So it's like n-dimensional Euclidean space, or n-dimensional hyperbolic space, or n minus one dimensional spheres. Um, uh, but it's a wedge of SNs. And again, just like this one, I'm not going to worry about exactly how many or exactly how I'm going to index them. And I'm also going to mention this is non-equivariant. There's no good, once you've collapsed this so that it's actually nicely a wedge of spheres, the G action disappears because you need to like pick particular base points. So um, this is just to uh, this is just to emphasize that this is very similar to the statement that this is a free abelian group. And this is the tangent bundle to 
x. So it turns out you can form this k theory as a Tom space uh, attached to this bundle. It turns out it, I don't have no idea what that was. Okay. Um, you, can, you can get a bundle on pt of x from that, and then you can take the Tom space of that. Um, and then the k theory is, the k theory is equivalent to this. Um, and again, because this is weakly equivalent to wedge of spheres, it has exactly one homology group. And it has, it's in, once you've desuspended it, it's going to be in degree zero. So at least rationally, the K, Ki is going to look just like the homology be, uh, using the appropriate stabilizer theorem. So the corollary is that Ki of P of Xg at least rationalized, is the same as the homology of G with coefficients in this Steinberg module. Again, rationalized. And the other nice thing is, oh, I wrote the two rationalizations in different ways. Um, and if X is Euclidean space, don't, you don't need to rationalize. I won't go into the details of why, but um, so what you get is that you have these, again, I'm going to put a discrete thing here just to remind you that these are not nice, um, that these K-theory groups are closely related to these homology groups. And these homology groups, not quite exactly, but these are very close to ones that appear in when people start studying rationalized K-theory of fields. These kinds of things start appearing with Steinberg coefficient modules, exactly of this kind of homology. And you don't get exactly the same Steinberg modules, and you don't get the exactly the same groups. But you get things that are very closely related, and they're approachable by similar techniques. So various results that you have about, say, GLN and standard Steinberg modules with standard actions can be modified to try to apply here. So I just want to mention these are, these are objects that are sort of independently of, of interest. Um, and they're the same as the K-theory groups of, uh, of scissors congruence. Well, not quite exactly the same, but similar to. Um, and what this means is that if we can compute this, we can compute the K-theory groups. Um, so uh, I won't get up to even dimension two, so you know, don't get too excited. But Kn of if we can take Euclidean space and we can just take just translations, and this is going to be the same as Kn of the circle with SO2. I can totally write, I apologize, SO2. And this is going to be a wedge of n plus 1 copies of R. And again, I want to remind you this is a wedge over Z. Um, and if we want to take the entire, if we want to take orientation reversing as well as orientation preserving isometries, what you get is this wedge in even dimensions and then zero in odd dimensions. We have no idea what this is going to look like in dimension two. This is it. Um, but you can do it. Look, we have another thing that we can write down all the k groups of, which is kind of cool. Um, OK, so th this is almost all of the calculations that I'm going to do. So this is at least one way to unify the idea of computing these k groups and these homology groups. They're really the same thing rationally. And the conjecture is they should really be the same thing Period. In the Euclidean case, we know that these things are already rational. So once you rationalize, it doesn't make any difference. And that's because translations are a vector space, and you can sort of, they're rational and, in fact, real. You can divide them. But if you're working with rotations, it becomes a lot fuzzier. And in fact, it's still not known when you take spherical and hyperbolic. It's known that they're two divisible. 
but it's not known that there's no P torsion for any other P. So we, we don't know. The, conjecturally, there shouldn't be any torsion. It doesn't really make sense for there to be torsion in those situations. So it should really be the case that these rationalizations are not needed, but that's still very much open in those situations. But here, this is an integral result. This is not a rationalized result. OK. OK, so these are the calculations that I promised you. So the next thing is trace maps. So in fact, this, this project was started because we wanted to try to construct a trace map. We wanted to see, can we do THH in this kind of situation? And the answer is no, for now. We don't know yet. None of those results. Um, but we can do something approximating a, tr a trace in the following way. So suppose, how might you start trying to construct a trace? Well, we have a nice measure on polytopes. We can take the volume. We don't, well, we know that it's not sufficient to distinguish them, but it's still a nice homomorphism from this group, the scissors congruence group, to a nice abelian group. Um, so in general, if you have a nice measure, so if this is an assembler, so we're going to take the object of C, and we're going to map it to some abelian group. And what we're going to assume is that for every covering family, I'll call this mu, um, pi to p. And I mentioned, as before, covering families are always going to be finite. Don't worry about infinite ones. You are allowed to have them in the topology, but all of the constructions are only ever going to do finite covering families. So i is always going to be finite. So for every covering family, we want the sum of the measures of the p components to be the measure of p. So it's a, it's a map that respects the sort of addition structure on both sides. Um, it turns out that then there exists a, I'm going to put functor into quotation marks because I haven't told you what it's a functor of, and it's not going to work with assemblers. So there exists a functor from C to an object called EA, which is closely related to the <coughs> usual uh, construction where you take an object for every element in A and then a morphism for every morphism and do stuff with it. It's closely related to that, which is why they're the name. And it's going to produce a map on K-theory from the K-theory of C to the K-theory of EA. Um, and if you do this construction correctly, this is actually HA. If, in addition, you have some G action here and you have some G action here and mu respects the G action, then we get a map this way. And then this is the homology, I suppose if I put stars on it, this is the homology of G with coefficients in A. And this is kind of like a trace. It's not you know, any kind of universal trace, but it's at least something that can work. And it's something we can actually do a computation with. So hang on, I'm going to make sure I don't screw the computation up. OK. OK, so what I want to look at is I want to look at k1 of p of two-dimensional Euclidean space with all isometries. So k1, this is generated by scissors automorphisms. Um, so what I mean is, suppose I have some kind of polygon. Um, I can cut it up into pieces. Um, in fact, there were colors. I'm going to do this with colors. So I'm going to cut out these two triangles. Um, sorry, I didn't actually want them to meet in the middle. Let's do this. We have a triangle here and the triangle here. And these triangles are congruent. So I have a yellow one and a pink one. And I can swap them. And 
this is what I mean by a scissors automorphism. You have two different decompositions of an object into pieces, and then you sort of move, match the pieces up. And because it's the same object, you've sort of gone back to the beginning. And it's generated by them, and there's some reasonable relations. Like if you take one and then you cut up all the pieces, but you still move them, it represents the same element in K1. If you do a scissors automorphism and then do another scissors automorphism, that's the addition in the group. If it's the trivial scissors automorphism, it's zero. Um, I don't actually know that this is a complete list of um, relations, but I think it should be. But those are definitely there. Um, and this, we can use volume to map this to the group um, H1 of, oh, did I want, yeah, I wanted, I apologize, S, I wanted to, only the orientation preserving ones. I don't want the orientation re reversing ones. And this goes to the homology using volume using this trace. It goes to the first homology of this homology group. And you can do the computation for what this is. And this is going to be r mod 2 pi z tensored over z with r. And the fact is, and again, hopefully I will get there. I'm not going to tell you how you compute this map. But you can actually, if you pick a representing scissors automorphism, the way that you compute its image in here is very simple. You take each uh, piece that you have, and you look at the isometry that's applied to it. And you send it to the class of that isometry in the abelianization tensored with the volume. So this is a very computable um, relation. And what I'm going to show you is that this map is actually surjective. Hmm? No, because you're tensoring over z. This is as abelian groups, not as. Um, so um, I want to show you that it's surjective. And to do that, I'm going to take, I'm going to pick a theta in here. And to show that it's surjective, because I can scale things and one of the coordinates is volume, really all I need to do is show that I can get any theta in here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a square, which is cosine theta by sine theta. Sorry, cosine theta plus sine theta by cosine theta plus sine theta. I don't know if I said that correctly. But anyway, and I'm going to do this classic picture. Um, so this is a one by one square. And I'm going to rearrange it into itself by rotating the 1 by 1 by 1 square by this theta. And then there is a, a, a theorem, and this is a theorem due to Hadwiger, that you can always, um, assuming, well, any two shapes where op op opposite sides are parallel, can be rearranged with the same area, can be rearranged into one another using only translations. Um, and so you can match these up into a rectangle, and you can match these up into a rectangle. So that's two rectangles. That's a, a, a shape where all the sides are parallel, like um, that come in parallel pairs. And similarly, or parallel groups, I suppose. And similarly, this outside L shape is like that as well. I was hoping to be able to draw you the picture, but it actually, like, the computation I did, you need at least eight pieces, and I don't really want to draw all eight pieces. Um, but you can do it with just translations, rearrange these into this. Um, and so this gives you theta tensor 1 in here. And so this is, uh, this is surjective. So this thing is non-zero. OK. Yay, now I can tell you something about proofs. Not very much, because I only have 20 minutes. But I can tell you something about proofs. OK.
OK, so to do that, really, I need to start by telling you what like, these objects actually are, because I said they were assemblers to give you some feel for sort of how they work um, geometrically, because I kind of feel like this gives you a nice geometric intuition for how you want to work with these things. But actually, we don't need like half of the axioms I put down. So a category with the covers is a category C um, together with families f sub i a i to b, which are closed under refinement. Meaning, if I have a family like this, and then I have a covering family for each of the AIs, I can compose through all of the pieces, and it gives me another covering family. And the geometric intuition is, if I have, you know, if I've taken a polygon and I've cut it up into pieces, and then I've cut all the pieces up into smaller pieces, that's still a cover of the entire polygon. So that's, that's the intuition you should be having. And then it needs to have an initial object And really, that's it. Uh, I'm going to say and no morphisms into it. There's one extra condition, but I'm not going to worry about it. Um, this is it. This is all you need. Um, because this is, turns out to be an extremely combinatorial result. You, just, you define the K-theory to only look at these kinds of this kind of decompositional information. And then, because of the way combinatorics works, it works. So the way that we're going to define the K-theory of C is that we're going to, well, it's a spectrum. And the Kth component is the nerve of a category W of SK smash C. Um, so this is like a Siegel K-theory type of construction, um, where this is a, a finite, simpl uh, finite simplicial set. And so I just need to define what it means to smash a finite pointed set with C. And then we can do a simplicial set. And I need to define this W. And that's it. So W of C has as its objects tuples AI, where I is finite, and AI is in C but not initial. Um, you're allowed to have I be empty, if you like. And then morphisms, so if you go, oh no, I'm not going to have space here. I'm going to put it over here. The morphisms are just, morally speaking, disjoint unions of covering families. So you have a map f from i to j, so just a map on the indexing sets, and maps fi from a i to b f of i. So we're, the map tells you how the different components map. And the components tell you how it maps. And you want the condition to be that uh, these f i's, so we have a i to b j, form a covering family. Um, And this is for all i in f inverse of j. So you take everything that maps to j, and you look at just those components, and that should be a covering family. And that should be the case for all j. So morally speaking, every morphism is a bunch of parallel covering families. And when you compose, sometimes you glue some of them together into a covering family of a larger thing. But really, that's it. It's just keeping track of which things should be equivalent under this decomposition. So this is the category W. 
Um, and I'm not going to write it down because this is sort of silly. When you smash a finite set with C, you take a disjoint union of that many copies of C, and then you glue all the initial objects together. You don't add any extra morphisms or anything. It's just you have several copies of C, and then for formal reasons, you want to have this nice initial object, and so you include that. And that's it. And then this is the K theory. And it satisfies the property that I put all the way up there, that K0 is what you want it to be. And K1 will always be generated by these kinds of scissors automorphisms, even in the more general context. So if you want to define a scissors, uh, um, if you want to write down generators for K1, you take an object, you write down two different covering families of the same object, and show a way to pairwise associate them. That's, that's what K1 generates. So th these are really like just a generalization of this idea. Now I have to erase. So the difficult thing about pulling the G action out is that when you are acting by G on the outside, you're only allowed to act by the G the same way on every component of an object. You have a single G coming from the outside and hitting an object, and so it hits every component in the same way. But when you're looking at C sub HG, you are allowed to act on, in a different way on every object. You, ha you, know, you have a lot more freedom. And so you can't just immediately say, oh yeah, this is, this is clear because we're acting by G here and we're acting by G there. And so the difficult part is actually figuring out how to pull that apart. And the key observation, I'm just going to erase both boards at once. Um, the key observation to make this work is that in spectra, the disjoint, the wedge and the product are weakly equivalent if you are uh, only doing finitely many components. And because we're doing K-theory, and K-theory is intrinsically finite, you can do that. And so what happens is if you split your K-theory space up appropriately, you end up with just being able to use that property in order to compare the two sides. That's really the key step. So I'm going to have a little bit over 10 minutes. I have a little bit of time to tell you just a general outline of how this proof goes. So I'm going to ignore, so a couple of things for this proof. You can completely ignore this SK. Because what's going to turn out is that we're going to show a bunch of things. We're going to decompose this, the nerve of W, into a bunch of ways. And because each of these components is itself a category with covers, all the result, it suffices to just prove a bunch of nice results about uh, the nerves of these Ws of categories with covers. OK, so we're going to have three steps. So the first step is the nerve of W C sub HG. And this is acting here. And one way to visualize the homotopy co-invariance of a simplicial set is to add a bisimplicial direction and have G act in that bisimplicial direction. So you can think of if you have your simplicial set, x0, x1, x2, you can think of each of these columns as the nerve of G acting on x0. So you take the objects to be x0, and you have the morphisms be elements of G, and you connect them appropriately. And you do the same thing in every column. And this gives you a bisimplicial set. And the geometric realization of that bisimplicial set is exactly your homotopy co-invariance. So you can think of this in this way. So this is, we're really thinking of this as a bisimplicial set. This is the diagonal of this bisimplicial set. 
Um, and again, our objects here are going to be, you know, simplices in the nerve here. And so each element G is acting on that entire object. So if you think about x0, these are the objects of this WC. So it's a tuple, and vertically we're moving the entire tuple by the element G. So these vertical things are, you can think of them all as isomorphisms in WC, but there are isomorphisms where every component is the same. So using that attitude, we're going to map this into the double nerve of a double category called UC sub, I'm going to call this UCG. And this is just literally expressing this. We're having, uh, now this is a double category. where the horizontal morphisms are morphisms in C, and the vertical morphisms are the G action. You can also think of these as morphisms, sorry, this is in W of C. These are morphisms in W of C sub HG where, um, remember I said that, I have this still up here, right? When we take this C sub HG, our morphisms have two components, a G component and an, and an F component, the internal component to the category and the group component. And here we want the internal component is, the, is an identity morphism. And all G components are the same. And this is really just a reinterpretation of this once you've seen it as this bunch of nerves. And now this, so this is an equivalence because it's really an isomorphism. Um, and now here we can map this double nerve into the f sort of a squared up W. So here, the horizontal morphisms are again the same. So here, I'm going to write these in yellow to, to distinguish. Here, the horizontal morphisms are the same. But the vertical morphisms are morphisms in W C sub H G, where the internal coordinate is an identity. But we're not, we're removing the condition that all the G components are the same. And then lastly, this, by mapping to the diagonal, maps to the nerve of W of C sub HG. And the way you do this is you, you have your nice grid of, when we're taking this, uh, sorry, this, the nerve of this bisimplicial set and taking the realization of nerve, uh, it's an n simplex is an n by n grid. And it's an n by n grid of morphisms inside W C sub H G. Just we put some conditions on the horizontal ones and some conditions on the vertical ones. And then what you can do is you can map it to a single simplex on the nerve by restricting to the diagonal. And this is an equivalence because up to unique isomorphism, mumble, mumble, um, nicely. Every morphism in WCHG factors uniquely as one of these vertical morphisms followed by one of these horizontal morphisms. You first do all of the Gs, and then you do all the things on the inside. And you can extend it into a grid nicely. And really, what this statement is, is you can extend this into a double category using like Waldhausen swallowing lemma type argument. And then say, oh, look, if you look at each of these, uh, which direction? In one direction, everything is isomorphic. Every morphism is isomorphic to a morphism like this. 
you know, every n simplex in WCHG is isomorphic via G actions to uh, an n simplex in the nerve of W just of C without the G action. So these are just sort of a level wise equivalence. And so this is an equivalence. And so really the only question is why is this an equivalence? And this is the place where you need to be a little bit clever, although, again, all we're really using is that inside spectra, wedges and products are the same. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, well, we have different numbers of Gs in every morphism, depending on how many copies of G you have. But they change only when you compose vertically. They don't change, uh, sorry, horizontally. They don't change when you compose vertically, because when you're composing vertically, it's just a bunch of G actions, and they're going to be parallel. So if we fix the horizontal direction, we know how many different Gs we have. And we can look at all things with that many numbers of Gs. So once we do that, it turns out that, there we go, um, that we're going to end up with these components that look like a bunch of G's, and then the nerve of W of C's. And then we're going to have, I suppose I said it, this is only true for spectra, so I suppose you should actually put in the spectrum coordinate so that this is actually true, as opposed to only being kind of true. Um, and on the other hand, this is the same as you can move the g's to the inside. Too many? Too many. Um, or you can map this to a product, and we're calling it a sum, but I really like this is just a standard Cartesian product of spectra. And again, you can move these to the inside. Where this is a sum of categories, by which I mean like a Cartesian product of categories. And the nerve nicely respects these. So this is an equivalence. And this is an equivalence for the exact same reason. If you look here, because we assumed that the initial object has no morphisms into it. There are not going to be any morphisms between the separate components of these in here. It's just going to be a bunch, you know, for each copy of this, there's just going to be a bunch of separate morphisms, which is why you can pull that out into the, um, into the sum. And well, we have three of these R weak equivalences, so the fourth one had better be two. So now we have another one of these things that, oh, it's level-wise equivalences in a particular fixed direction. So once we, we geometrically realize it's going to be an equivalence, and that tells us that that middle morphism is a weak equivalence. And what that says is that the, you know, that is every level of the K theory. So really, when you spectrify it, the top is the homotopy covariance of the K theory. And the bottom is the K theory of the homotopy covariance. So that's that, and we are done. Because. Um, well, because naively, because if you want to go from homotopy to homology, they're only going to be the same if you rationalize. Um, as I said, we think you don't actually need to rationalize. No, no, you can't. It's what about this Friedlander-Milner condition that I mentioned? 
So that one is usually for finite things, and this is very not. Yeah. Um, it's actually, this, um, Goncharov has some conjectures relating these to like the rationalized part of the K theory of C. So these are, these are sort of orthogonal things. There's the rational part and there's the finite part. Oh, uh, here? Yeah. So what this is, is it's, the, it's a suspension of the teeth building of your space. Either if it's spherical, you want, uh, you know, you want one dimension up, you know, or you can just take subspaces of Euclidean space, and this is why you end up with this sort of annoying dimension shifting, and teeth buildings are always wedges of spheres. Yes. Um, it's not a coincidence exactly, but it's also kind of like. Just like we're adding angles. Yeah, we're just we're adding angles, and there's sort of, that's sort of how you get, and you need to weigh them somehow. And what else are you going to weigh them by? I have a conjecture that it's not a coincidence in a different way as well, but I don't have any math behind that conjecture. I just have sort of fuzzy. This is how things should be. Um, Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. 